Our scripture reading this evening is from the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verses 1 through 14. Revelation, chapter 11, 1 through 14. Hear the word of God as it comes to us this evening. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, Fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them. And shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three and a half, three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Thus far the reading of sacred scripture. Dear congregation, we've been observing in recent months that the book of Revelation is all about Jesus Christ, all about the comfort of the persecuted saints, and that it was not written to satisfy our carnal curiosity, but rather the book of Revelation is meant for the church today as a key to open not only what is happening in the world, but particularly to see that Jesus Christ stands astride the globe and that he, the angel of the covenant, is in control of all things. He's ruling the church. He's ruling the governments of this world. He's ruling the affairs of men for the sake of his church. That's what we've been seeing in chapter 10, and that continues in chapter 11 this evening. And meanwhile, the trumpets are sounding, the wrath of God is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And in the midst of all this activity in these chapters, the church, the bride of Christ, preserved by Christ, is witnessing to and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one of the amazing facts of these chapters that are so challenging to understand, that the church is the one enduring fact of history. In the midst of all persecution, the church perseveres. 
The ancient church father, Tertullian, rightly said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. How many times the church has been pronounced dead? Many times the world has written the church's obituary, celebrated its demise, only to find the church springing back to life again. Well, that's what we have before us in chapter 11. Not only the church in John's day under persecution, but also in the days of John Wycliffe and the Lollards, in the days of John Huss and the Hussites, in the days of the Waldensians, the Reformation, the Puritan age, and the church today in Ethiopia and China and Brazil springing back to life. The church keeps coming back. The church has never conquered. Every world power was defeated. Every business company has come and gone. But the church is built by Jesus Christ. He's in control. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. The church is the only organization, if we can call it that, that has survived for 2,000 years. And so Revelation 11 is underscoring for us once again, you can never, never write off the church. And what an encouragement for our day. Our day of terrorism, our day of unbelief, our day of wretched worldliness, our day of the legislation of the grossest forms of immorality from the highest powers that be. Jesus Christ is on the throne. Jesus Christ is is in control, and the church must witness to that fact even when she is being persecuted. That is what Revelation 11 is all about. So we want to look this evening with you from Revelation 1, 11 rather, 1 through 14, at this theme of the church's witness to Jesus Christ. We're going to look first at the church's true identity, second at her twofold testimony, third at her terrible ordeal, and fourth at her final triumph. The church's witness to Christ, the true identity of the church, verses one and two, the twofold testimony of this church, three through six, the terrible ordeal of this church, seven through ten, and the final triumph of this church, eleven through 14. Now, in the opening verses of Revelation 11, the archangel of the previous chapter gives John a measuring rod, like a staff, and tells him, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court, which is around the temple, leave out and measure it now. Measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty in two months. Now, these are challenging words. And if we get these two verses wrong, we probably will get all of the book of Revelation wrong. How are we to interpret this vision? Well, It's helpful for me at this point to remind you briefly and to set this in the context of what we saw in the very first sermon in this series about the different interpretations of the book of Revelation. But there are really three major views of these two verses, and let me just bring them to you briefly. First, there is the futurist view, the most common evangelical view today in America is that This description of the temple, together with the altar and the outer court, describes a literal building that will be built in the future. And this approach is associated with what is called dispensational theology. Dispensationalism teaches that there's different periods in the history of mankind. God rules each period by certain Laws, and then he dispenses with that period and brings a new one in. And dispensationalism teaches that God's plan for Israel and for the church are two fundamentally divergent plans. 
Dispensationalists say that when the Bible talks about Israel, it does not mean the church in the New Testament age. When it talks about the church, it does not mean Israel. The two are separate. Well, one of the problems with this view is that when the book of Revelation is seen primarily as addressing God's future plans for ethnic Israel, literal Israel, then, except for the opening three chapters, this whole book has no direct message for the Christian church in John's day, as well as in our own day. And such a thesis is hardly credible, especially when in John's day, the churches were being threatened by persecution, and this book is all written to a persecuted church. You see, under dispensationalism's literal approach, the temple which John is here told to measure is a literal building which a reconstituted Israelite state will erect on Mount Zion in the future. Now, you probably know that today the temple mount of Mount Zion is currently occupied by two rather prominent Islamic mosques, the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Well, dispensationalists say those mosques have to go, probably through bloody warfare, and a new Jewish temple must be put in their place before Christ returns. And dispensationalists are very encouraged by the fact that there's a Jewish state now since 1948, and the capture of Jerusalem by Israel in the Six-Day War in 1967, these are seen as signs, signs of the imminent rebuilding of the temple and then the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you turn on the radio to almost any station that deals with the last times, you'll hear this view propounded again and again. And then the three and a half years becomes a concrete period near the end of, of great tribulation. And there's a rapture. And you see, all, all these reasons that dispensationalism has become so popular in the last century is because these historical events associated with Israel have, uh, have put on flesh, on, on the bones of prophecy in their viewpoint. And yet there are very great difficulties with dispensational theology. For one thing, when Jesus foretold the destruction of the temple in Matthew, he said nothing about a rebuilt temple. And that shouldn't be surprising because the temple's purpose involved sacrificing animals to point to the atonement of Jesus Christ to come. And Christ himself has now fulfilled that symbolism. He's the reality. He's the Lamb of God. As Hebrews 10 says, he put an end to all those sacrifices. Thank God there's not going to be a rebuilt temple. There's no longer a valid purpose for that temple building and for its priesthood. That's why Jesus died in the cross. That's why the veil was rent before the temple and the whole temple ministration was done away. God's putting an end to the symbol because the reality has come. If there's a rebuilt temple and sacrifices are reinstituted, that would deny the very sufficiency of Christ's atoning death. So the idea of a future Israelite nation being restored by God to its temple sacrifices flatly contradicts the entire New Testament. But secondly, in AD 70, God destroyed the temple precisely because he was judging the Jews' rejection of Jesus' atonement. A rebuilt temple would merely reestablish the rejection of that atonement. It would be a curse. So even though we believe, in accord with Romans 11, that God will revive his ancient people Israel in the last days, and many Jews will be converted to Christ, this dispensational idea of God restoring Israel to the very temple he once destroyed is simply bizarre. Even if such a temple would be erected by the Jews, it would only be a monument of its unbelieving rejection of the finished work of the cross. But third, Revelation 11 is not about Jerusalem's temple being rebuilt just before Christ returns, because 
Jesus himself has told us that true worship is now spiritual in character, not confined to any building. The emphasis, of course, in the Old Testament, too, was on spirituality. But in the New Testament era, that is particularly true. Jesus said, he who worships me isn't going to worship in Jerusalem, but he's going to worship in spirit and truth. He says, from now on, this is the center of worship, not a place, not a building, not a holy city. From now on, the Father seeks worshipers, men and women, boys and girls, who will worship him in spirit and truth. This is the true temple, not Solomon's temple or Herod's temple. This is the great theme of the New Testament. So the whole futuristic view is punctured with all kinds of theological problems. The second view is what we call the preterist view, the preterist view. And the opposite of the first view that looks, puts all these predictions in the future, the preterist view puts them all in the past. The preterist view says the way to interpret Revelation 11, 1 and 2 is to say that these 42 months here and this measuring of Jerusalem, this has all happened in the past. It's all done. All the prophecies of Revelation are already done and they were fulfilled in 70 AD, in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Well, there's two major problems with this view as well. First of all, John didn't write the book of Revelation. We've, sh- we've seen at the beginning of this series of sermons that he didn't write it in the 60s, but he wrote it in the 90s. He wrote it after Jerusalem had already fallen. So that puts a major problem and forces the preterist to somehow try to get this book written way back in the 60s, which we know is, is not true. But there's another problem. There's an inconsistent application of a literal and a symbolic interpretation here. You see, the preterist view says the temple is symbolic, the court is symbolic, verses 1 and 2, but the holy city is literal. So it takes one part of it literally and the other part symbolically, and it's inconsistent. It's obviously not the correct solution to Revelation 11. So the third view, which is our view that we've been taking from the beginning of our series, the symbolic view, is really the only way to view this passage. Because the book of Revelation and all its numbers and all its genre is not to be taken literally. It's not written in that way. We take the Bible literally whenever we have a reason. That's our norm. But whenever we have a compelling reason to take something allegorically or symbolically, then we have to do so. This is the kind of literature the apocalyptic literature is. And so we believe that symbolism is simply Revelation's method of communicating historical reality. And so under this view, our view, John is not foretelling distant events about a literal future temple building, nor is he looking to past events that happened prior to his writing. But he's describing the situation we are in today. The whole book is for the church of all ages, the New Testament age. And so the New Testament temple here It's not just one building on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The New Testament temple is you and me, dear believer. That's what the New Testament temple is all about. Over and over again, the temple idea in the New Testament, Paul tells us, Peter tells us, is not about a building, a literal building. It's about the church. Paul says, know you not... 1 Corinthians 3, that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. And later he says, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell in you and walk in you and I will be your God and you shall be my people. And Peter speaks the same way. 1 Peter 2 verse 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus 
Christ. So as scholars have pointed out, Reformed scholars, biblical scholars, the focus is now on the whole covenant community forming a spiritual temple in which God's presence dwells. So what's happening? What's happening is God is giving John this measuring stick, and he says, go measure the temple. He's showing his commitment to preserve the church through the tribulations of the persecuted ages of the New Testament era. And he's erecting a barrier to protect his true people. And that's exactly consistent with what he did back in Revelation 7. You remember, with the sealing, the vision of the sealing of the saints. The angel came to put a mark on all true believers so that they would be saved and they would emerge through the tribulations and make it safely to heaven. So here too, the church is measured out, guarded, protected. But the interesting thing here is that John is told in verse 2, he's not to measure the court outside of the temple. What in the world does that mean? Well, It's a symbolic use of the court of the Gentiles. The true church, the living church, the invisible church, is the church that's being protected. Not just people that are on the fringe of the church, not just the nominal members of the church. Outside the temple here is a symbol for nominal Christians, people who are associated with the church, close as it were, to the church, but not truly spiritual members of the church. And so John is concerned here about false faith, about false teaching. And that's a concern all of John and of God, writing through John, all throughout the book of Revelation. You remember the seven churches back in chapters 2 and 3? There's always this concern about nominal believers about being lukewarm, being spewed out of Christ's mouth, or tolerating false teaching, uh, being dead believers, having a name that you live but are dead. You see, this is consistent, this view, with the whole book of Revelation. So John is told to go out with this measuring stick to distinguish between the sanctuary and the outer courts. He's not to really count those who are just in the outer courts. The idea is that in the inner court, in the inner court, in in the sanctuary, in the true worship, those are the people who worship God in spirit and truth. They dwell in the secret place of the Most High. They are the ones counted, measured, guarded, protected. Those who've come by faith and repentance to embrace salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. They are the ones that God promises to protect and bring through. And that raises the question then, doesn't it? Who are we? Are we, are we in the internal essence of the church? Or, or perhaps we sit in church pews in this sanctuary, but we're still on the outer circumference of the church. We still haven't been brought into true regeneration. We're still in an external covenant relationship when we're unsaved. And we haven't been brought to faith and repentance. So what about you, my friend? Have you you entered through that torn curtain of Christ's humanity, through the veil of his flesh, to the blood that he shed upon the cross? Have you entered into the holy place? Do you have a personal relationship with God through the Savior? You see, the point is, not everyone's an Israelite who calls himself an Israelite. And so in our generation, not everyone's a Christian who calls himself a Christian. Attending church faithfully, being in the outer court, as it were, of the internal essence of the church, does not mean that you're you're born again and all is well with your soul. So in these opening verses, we really have a description here of the true church. A true church consisting of all those who are entered by the blood of Jesus into the holiest, who are worshiping at the altar in the inner sanctuary, who dwell in the secret place of the Most High, who have a real relationship with the living God. That must be our experience, our portion. 
That is the true church of Jesus Christ. Now, John then goes on to tell us that this true church has a twofold testimony. In verses 3 through 6, this is really the main theme of the chapter here. Let me read them, read verse 3 again. And I will give power unto my witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred, threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Now, if you do the mental arithmetic, you compare verses 2 and 3, you'll notice that the 42 months in verse 2 is, in fact, 1,260 days in verse 3. It's the same period of time. So John is told that the holy city, think now, the living church, will be trampled upon by the nations, and there'll be a period of persecution, 42 months. Now again, you have to ask yourself the question, what is the whole book of Revelation about? Does that mean exactly three and a half years? Well, none of the other numbers of Revelation have been literal. It's a period of time. But as you might surmise, the literal approach of the dispensationalist says there's going to be exactly three and a half months. The preterist says there was exactly three and a half months in the past when Jerusalem was destroyed. And of course, we know historically it wasn't three and a half, uh, or three and a half years rather. It wasn't three and a half years that it took to destroy Jerusalem. But preterists believe that it was somehow. No, it's a symbolic approach. These 42 months, these three and a half years aren't expressing an exact quantity of time, but they're expressing a quality of time. The church is going to face periods throughout her history of persecution. And we've seen that from the beginning till now. In fact, we live in the time of the greatest persecution in the last 2,000 years. But why is this period of persecution in verse 2 thought of in terms of months? And in verse 3, in terms of days? Well, that's a tough question. And I suppose no one knows the answer for sure. But the church is besieged. And that besieging of the church is... Well, you count it month by month, don't you? When the church is under persecution, it's a, it's, a, it's a powerful time. It's a hard time for the church. It's not easy for a church to be under persecution. But in verse 3, the picture changes a bit. It's not so much now the picture of the church being besieged, like in verse 2, but now it's a picture of the church going out into the world as a powerful evangelizing and missionary organization. And perhaps we now read about days because every day counts. Every day is another day for the church to go out and evangelize the world. However that may be, certainly our call to evangelize, the true church's call to evangelize is a daily task. But notice how we are to evangelize. Verse 3, these two witnesses are described for us as being clothed in sackcloth. That's very important. It tells us something about the emphasis we ought to have when we evangelize and in our witnessing. So much evangelization today happens as an act of celebration. You go out and tell people what a wonderful life they can have, and you don't tell them about sin. You don't tell them about their separation from God. You don't give them a call to repentance or confession of sin. There's no negatives. It's all positive. It's all about living a wonderful health and wealth gospel and a wonderful life. Well, there is an element of that, of course, in evangelization. But the message we have to proclaim to the world is that the world is under the judgment of God. The world needs to be called to repentance. We need to wear sackcloth. The missing note in so much evangelism today It's precisely that there's no sackcloth, no repentance, no urgency, no genuine warning. And the message John is bringing in chapter 10 and chapter 11 is that the world and the trumpets are sounding. And we need to hear the voice of the living God. And we are to be God's mouthpieces, dear believers. We are to be God's trumpets to warn this world of the wrath which is to come. 
And then in verses 4 through 6, we have a kind of compendium of information about how we are to witness to others. Uh, let me read 4 through 6 again. By the way, I hope you're following in your Bible because that will that's, that'll be very helpful as we go through these last verses especially. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. If any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. That language seems vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Can you think of Old Testament characters that reflect this language? Well, in verse 4, you've got Zechariah, don't you? Zechariah is referred to as the one who was involved with the two olive trees and the two candlesticks. Remember verses 4 four through 6 of Zechariah. Then you've got Elijah. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And then the second half of verse 6, you've got Moses, have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with plagues as often as they will. And in verse 5, you've got Jeremiah, if any man will hurt them, fire proceeded out of their mouth, devoureth their enemies. Jeremiah 5, 14. And so what you'll have is you've got four evangelists, as it were, Moses, Elijah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, grouped together as the outgrowth of verse 3 saying to us basically this, though these men did not have easy lives, though it wasn't easy for Moses to be in Egypt, Elijah to be evangelized under the reign of Ahab and Jeremiah, Jezebel, and Jeremiah to be a weeping prophet, they were faithful evangelists. They sat in sackcloth and brought the word of God, no matter what the cost. And they brought it in dependency on the Holy Spirit. That's a beautiful reference to Zechariah here. The picture of the candlestick and the olive tree. You know the candlestick is the church, of course, in Zechariah 4. So that is again consistent with our interpretation of this chapter. And the oil is the Holy Spirit who draws the oil from Jesus Christ and The word of God says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So the church will prevail against the world. The church will evangelize the world and bring the world in and deliver the world from all of its false isms, not by the force of ideas or by the might of the persuasion or organizational power of the evangelists or of Christians themselves, but by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit using Christians by holding up the light of the gospel, by the church being a candlestick and a witness. And so John is calling us through this symbolic language to be an Elijah, a Moses, a Jeremiah, a Zechariah to our own generation. To witness of Jesus Christ and to witness of the Holy Spirit. Are you praying that your life will be such a witness? Is it your burden that you might evangelize others? This is the call of the church, the living church, the church that's measured and guarded and protected and cherished by God to proclaim the word of God. The church's witness to Christ will bring it into terrible difficulties. Verses 7 through 10 go on to say of this terrible ordeal of the church that when they shall have finished their testimony, that is, finished their evangelizing, witnessing, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and overcome them and kill them, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified." And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall sing gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Well, this too is highly symbolic 
language, language that's speaking of what really is going on all the time in the church that's under persecution. It's not something just futuristic. 200 years ago, the famous Frenchman Voltaire predicted that within one century, the church will be an obsolete, the Bible will be an obsolete book, and the church will be an obsolete church. And one century later, his own home in Paris was turned into a missionary center and a Bible depot. You see, God is constantly turning tables upon the world. The world is always writing off the church and God is always reviving the world. But the church will suffer. The church will suffer hugely. The church suffered under Russia, and yet it grew in the time of profound persecution. Chinese leaders tried to stamp out the church, and today the church in China is millions strong. The world is always, you see, trying to stamp out the light of the gospel. That's what you see in all the symbolism of, of these verses. It's not to be taken literally again of Jerusalem or some limited geographical entity. It's Jerusalem, the city of the church, where Christ was crucified. That city is constantly reappearing in history, as it were, symbolically, everywhere where there's persecution. It reappears under different names and guises. It uh, reappears here under Sodom and Egypt. and It appears under Babylon and Rome and New York and Paris and London. Wherever the church is buffeted by the world, there this city dwells. The city where Christ was crucified is everywhere where men and women, egged on by that beast from the pit, cry out, crucify him, crucify him from our city. Today it's in San Francisco, big time. It's in Washington, D.C. in a major way. It's all over the world. In fact, by nature, it's you and me, the city of man's soul. By nature, we have no room for the Messiah. By nature, we reject him. And so it's not just the Sodom out there and the Egypt out there, the Babylon out there, but also the Babylon, the Egypt, the Sodom in our own souls. Whenever we're egged on by the devil and set up ourselves against Christ and his people and show callous disregard for the truth, we are putting the church under this terrible ordeal. And many in the church will be slain, are slain. Every day, people are losing their lives in our present day world for being Christian. And this prophecy says their bodies will be left in the street. The world doesn't even give them a proper burial. Immediately, the world celebrates. They rejoice, says John. They congratulate each other that the witnesses are now dead, that they're no longer going to be troubled by the voice of the church anymore. Well, you can see this is not just Jerusalem. This is all over the world. It's in Grand Rapids. A week or two ago, there's a paper, an uh, article from the Grand Rapids Press on, on the expansion of our seminary. And the very first response from someone from Grand Rapids said something like this, what, what outdated, old-fashioned bigotry. We don't need this. We need the modern God, the God science. We certainly don't need old-fashioned religion. That should be done away with once for all. You see, that's verbal persecution. But we don't know what we will face in the future. But in in one sense, it doesn't really ultimately matter. All we're called to do is to be faithful witnesses for Christ in the face of all kinds of opposition. And so the terrible ordeal comes and goes. It varies in intensity, but it's always the church's lot. The world will hate you, said Jesus, because the world hated me. If the world loves us, we've got a problem. Because our philosophy is completely contrary to the world. And in the end of the day, the church will get the victory. 
That's what Jesus says in verses 11 through 13. The final triumph of the church. After three and a half days, the spirit of life from God entered into them. They stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Now they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. The remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. Well, this too must not be pushed off entirely to the future. It certainly does apply to the future. This is a picture of what it's going to be like when finally the last trumpet sounds and Jesus returns. And you notice here there's no secret rapture in verse 12, but an open vindication. When Christ comes, the church is going to be caught up to heaven at that very moment, not in some secret sort of way, but in full sight of the enemy, says John. In other words, the last trumpet is going to announce God's final vindication of the gospel. God will have the final word. That's what John sees. That's what he's passing on to the persecuted Christians of his day. Don't worry. Don't despair. Don't abandon faith. Don't go shipwreck of your faith. You'll have the final word because your God will have the final word. You'll be vindicated in the end. And that's that's the whole comforting theme of Revelation. The theme of Revelation is that though the odds of the world and its powers are stacked against the church, though the Goliaths of this world are stacked against the little David of the church, the church will prevail. Rome, with all its might as this world's empire, trying to crush them, will not prevail. God will have the final word. It happened all the time in the Old Testament, didn't it, with Israel? Through the Red Sea, Esther becomes queen. It happens all the time in the New Testament. The church survived Nero, survived Domitian. It happens all the time in church history, even till today. It happened in the time of the Great Awakening. Where was the church then? The church was dead in the streets, seemingly. There was little spiritual life in her. Even most ministers in the 1720s and 30s were lackluster in their work. And God comes along, and he raises up a George Woodfield, a Howell Harris, a Daniel Rowland, many others all over the country and all over the United Kingdom without any obvious connection to each other. And the breath of God enters the church, enters the valley of dead bones again. And they stand on their feet, as John says here, referring back to Ezekiel. Son of man, can these bones live? And we're prone to say, no, the church is dead. There's no chance. But the breath of God comes. And the church stands on its feet. You know, the other day I... I read this remarkable statement that shortly before the Reformation, actually three and a half years, 42 months, I don't want to make too much of that, before the Reformation, May 5, 1514, this statement was read officially in the Latin, Lateran Council in the Roman Catholic Church. I quote, the whole body of Christendom is subject to one hand, even to that of the Pope. No one now opposes us. No one now objects. You see, Rome with its heresies, with its anti-Christian rhetoric, had the Lollard stamped out, or so they thought. They had silenced the Hussites through the Inquisition and killing them. Gospel truth had been distinguished, extinguished rather, it seemed, Three and a half years later, October 31, 1517, Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the cathedral door in Wittenberg, showing what the gospel consists of, and God brought in the greatest revival the church has ever seen. Rome had left the church for dead in its streets But God came and breathed into those dry bones and they stood upon their feet. I will build my church and the gates of hell and the counsels of the devil 
and the beast from the pit with all his machinations and all his plots and the false church will not prevail. That's the message of Revelation 11. So I close this sermon this evening with two applications. First is to true believers. John says in his epistle that as Jesus Christ was in the world, so are we. If you look carefully at these verses, you see in verse 8, his crucifixion. Verse 11, his resurrection. Verse 12, his ascension. We as Christians, true Christians, follow his career. That's what it means to be a Christian, to die with him, to reign with him, to live with him. It won't be easy. Jesus' life on this earth wasn't easy. The Christian life is never easy. To be a Christian means to follow the Christ. It means to enter into suffering, to come to glory. And so the question to you, dear people of God, is are you aware of this? Do you expect this? Are you willing to share in Christ's suffering, knowing that that is also the way to share in his glory? Are you truly following the Lord Jesus Christ. But then my second and final application is to you who are nominal believers. I can't leave this passage without exhorting you in love. In some ways, you're like the Gentiles admitted to the outer courts. At Herod's temple in Jerusalem, there was an outer court with a barrier, and the non-Jews could come there, but they couldn't pass. They really weren't a part of it. John is saying something like that in Revelation 11. He's saying if you're not saved, you can be a nominal member of the church. You can come to church faithful. You can give in the collections. You may even come to the Lord's Supper for that matter. But God's banner is not flying over you. His barrier is not around you if you just simply attend church, if you just say Christian things, if you just associate with the church, but don't participate, don't evangelize, aren't a living member of that church. Maybe your family raised you. Maybe your family raised you in this church. Maybe you're going through the motions. Maybe you've never become a lost sinner before a holy God. You've never begged forgiveness of him. You've never come to the altar in truth. You've never patiently, penitently, earnestly surrendered your sins at that altar. You've never said, I need Jesus Christ. Give me Jesus, else I die. You've never needed the cross. If there were no such thing as the cross, you'd go on living the same kind of life. You can live without the Bible, even though you read the Bible. You pray, but your prayers are empty. You're not coming to God by faith. You're not living the truths you hear from Sabbath to Sabbath. Oh, you like it when others pray for you, but you don't know what it means to wrestle in prayer yourself with the Almighty. You're a nominal Christian. You're not measured in this vision. You're outside the inner circle of grace. Yet you're a covenant member in one sense. You're here in the church. You're under the means of grace. You're externally related. But it's not enough, my friend. You must be born again. You must come to faith and repentance. The worldly church, the nominal church member, in the end of the day, will be given over to the nations, to the side of the world. How tragic. What will it be to be raised in the church and to end with the devil? You need to come to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You must come to the New Testament mercy seat, the right hand of the Father, the cross of Calvary. You must confess your sin. You must ask God to show you your need. You must do like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. You must run from the city of destruction into the narrow way that leads to the celestial city. When others pull at you and try to tug, you, tug at you to bring you back, 
Put your fingers in your ears and cry out, eternal life, eternal life. I need eternal life. And as evangelist guided Christian to that way of salvation, that new birth in Jesus Christ, through faith and repentance. So I stand before you tonight with your other ministers as well as evangelists, and we point you to the cross. To the cross you must go. To the cross you can alone find salvation. And Jesus Christ is everything you need. Don't turn away. Don't be content to stay in the outer court. You need a savior for your soul. You need a personal relationship with a living God. Pray when you come to this house of prayer that you will meet Jesus here and be saved of your sin and be a real and vital living member of the church. Don't go your own way. And don't think that somehow it's all going to come out okay. Today is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted time. Seek God's face. Cry out for mercy. Ask the big questions. Men and brethren, what shall I do to be saved? Don't go on in a fog. Don't go on with scales on your eyes. Don't go on living half in the world and half in the church and losing both in the end. Cast your lot on the Lord's side. Fall upon mercy and say, mercy must save me. Upon mercy I will fall. If mercy must cast me out, then I will abide here and mercy must cast me out. But here I am. I can do no otherwise. If I perish, I perish. And those who fall upon mercy will not perish. Run to mercy. Because mercy is running to you. You know, there was a guy named Condros this past week in Boston. He was watching the marathon race. And when the bombs began to go off, everybody in the crowd ran away from the chaos, ran away from the bombs. But this man, who had a son who died in Iraq and was remembering him in this marathon race, jumped a barricaded fence and ran to the trouble. It was mercy running to bring a message of mercy. And as he got to the victims, he took his own clothes and made tourniquets, grabbed anything he could find. And he said there were limbs everywhere, blood everywhere. It was mercy coming to display mercy. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ comes to you in the gospel with much greater mercy. You're self-destructing when you're not ready to meet him. He's coming to you in mercy in the gospel every single week. He desires to heal. He loves to heal sinners. He's in the miracle working business of regeneration. Oh, that you would respond to mercy by running to mercy. That you would meet your Savior and know him and love him and serve him and yourselves become witnesses and evangelists of him. He's worthy to be sought. He's worthy to be repented toward. He's worthy to love all your lifetime. So don't go your own way. Bend the knee to King Jesus. And don't rest until you too can say, I am a real, vital, living member of the church that witnesses of Jesus Christ.
Amen. Gracious God, we bow before thee in these moments. We thank thee so much for the gospel. The gospel embedded even in complicated and challenging chapters like Revelation 11. Lord, there's so much we don't know. So much that is challenging in these chapters, but help us to continue in this series of sermons to stay with what we do know and do bless it and do apply it to all of our hearts that we might live as faithful witnesses of thy truth and as living members of thy church in a world that is hostile to the truths of free and sovereign grace. Please, Remember the nominal members of our church, Lord. Oh, may they receive the loving exhortation in these moments with, with love and bend the knee before the king, the king of kings and the priest of priests and the prophet of prophets and find that only savior whom to know is life eternal. But also be with thy people. Help us to be better witnesses of thy truth, to stand up for it, even if it means persecution. Lord, help us to serve thee faithfully in this present evil generation. Oh, have mercy upon us. Have mercy upon our church, our schools. Be with them this week, the students, the teachers, the administrators. And help us in every sphere of life to live wholly and solely for thee. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.